Hi everybody, this is the video reflection for Good Friday. Or as some of my colleagues and I have been talking about, this is about the realest Good Friday we've ever experienced. Um, this year, we're not imagining loss. We're living it. And what we've done metaphorically in the past on Monday, Thursday and stripping of the altar and removing all of the decoration and the, the comfort and the shiny things and the beauty um, from our altar. That's what we're living right now. We're living without gathering. We're living without the sound of one another singing. We're living without the rituals that are familiar and whose words we know and whose rhythmic return in the seasons we can count on. As I've said before, the underlying reality remains, but we're left without uh, these outward invisible signs of those inward and spiritual graces and gifts that, that God gives us. As you recall, the service for Good Friday is unlike almost any other service. Uh, there's a very long reading from the Gospel of John, um, the Passion Gospel, according to John. And um, I encourage you to read it. Uh, I also recognize that um, what I'm finding in myself and so many others is Sustained bits of attention are, are really difficult to come by. Uh, so I'm not going to read the whole thing today, but I am going to read um, my absolute favorite part um, that just grabs me so much and, and actually is, is so deeply a part of my own uh, theology that I ended up writing about this um, for my master's thesis uh, in divinity school. So I'll read just this portion. Um, and I should say that you, the point at which we're at when this happens is um, that Jesus has taken the cross and they've mocked him and divided his clothes and uh, nailed him to the cross. And uh, the women are standing around in their their courageous grief in their enduring presence, even as the men have run off in fear and shame to hide. This is the last thing that Jesus does before uh, he dies. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. One of the icons I um, keep closest to me uh, on my desk is um, one that I got at the Russian Icon Museum, which is in Clinton, Massachusetts. And it's not exactly an icon of this passage, but it always makes me think of this passage. So here's this um, very rare image of Mary and Jesus together. And usually see you see Mary as the Theotokos, or the God bearer, and so she's she's holding the infant Jesus on um, on her lap. But here he's fully grown, and here he is, and his it seems that he's been stripped, and he is so full of sorrow and pain, and now she's actually comforting him, 
um, and they're they're embracing in the midst of this um, profoundly uncomfortable, painful, strange posture um, that just speaks of so much pain, but of this intense closeness of of Mary and Jesus, even in the midst of pain and suffering and loss. And so that's what I sort of picture um, as as what's underneath this unbelievable gesture that Jesus makes from the cross in in saying, woman, behold your son. Son, here is your mother. So um, this, to me, this gesture, uh, I think in moments of my... um, Deepest doubt, deepest despair, most forlorn, darkest places, um, when it feels like there's nothing to hold on to. That gesture is, of all the things that we have some record of Jesus saying or doing, that is the one that grabs me. And that is the one that puts something solid down for me to step on and stand up again. This, I think, goes to the absolute heart of who Jesus is and what we as Christians are, are, are a part of. That even in the midst of one's own suffering, even in the midst of the suffering of God, um, what the work of Christ is, is to give us to one another in close, close connection. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, oh, it's our church family. And I find myself resisting that because I think for most of us, we need to treat others better than we treat our family members. Um, and so, you know, and we, of course, have our habits that may or may not be full as, as intentional and loving and out of our sort of highest and best selves that we kind of, uh, reflexively resort uh, too, when we when we go into sort of family patterns, so so I push back on the sort of church as family metaphor um, for those reasons. But I think there's some deep truth at the heart of it as well. And this is this is it. This is that thing where it's not about those outward invisible signs of pleasantness and things being fine, but rather in the midst of our loss. In the midst of unspeakable horror, Christ gives us to one another. So that even as we go alone in our homes, we're not without one another. Uh, (laughs) This is profound. And so unbelievably moving. And so deeply true, even when everything else might seem like nonsense. So I wanted to offer this um, to you today in terms of, you know, if you find yourself not someone who finds this resurrection story easy to go along with, if you find yourself angry at God, if you find yourself now grieving somebody who's been lost to this pandemic, or if you are yourself hiding in fear because you're worried about your own body's capacity to fight off this virus, then this, I think, is the passage for you. Woman, behold your son. Son, here is your mother. Here we are for one another. What that looks like obviously looks different than any other time that we've come together to support one another. But Jesus doesn't give us one another just in times of of pleasantness and parties. His, His miracle at the wedding of Cana was the first thing he did. But this giving of one another to one another is the last thing that he did. On Monday, Thursday, he gave us the commandment to love one another. 
on Good Friday. He tried to make that as as palpable and obvious as it could be. And it says, uh, John, this beloved disciple, took Mary into his home from that point onward, treated her as his own mother. So, in this time in which nothing is, is as we'd like it to be, um, in which we are having to stay away from church, when we're having to stay away from one another, let this be a different kind of fast. Um, I was never a fast person. Um, you know, I was kind of always been a bit high strung and I thought, man, my metabolism can't handle this. Um, but it's a worthwhile experiment, you know, of course, in this time, I'm talking about food and you have to use your own judgment and knowledge of your own health to, to say whether that's possible. Um, but right now we're in enforced, we are in an enforced fast from normal. And we can be victims of that. We can avoid it by various sort of addictive or numbing distraction behaviors. And, you know, there's a place for some of that. Um, but if we are to treat this as a fast, then we bring a kind of intention to it and bring a kind of consciousness uh, to it. When we fast from food, it's not because food is bad uh, and it's not because we are bad. Um, and it's not because hunger is bad. We fast to change, at least temporarily, our relationship to the thing we want. And so I think as we fast from communion, from Eucharist, when we fast from gathering with one another, we're also able to bring some intention and to bring some clarity and some prayer and some prayerful thinking to our relationship to those things. I think too easy with anything that becomes familiar or habit, and particularly, you know, in our tradition, we've got a small number of prayers that we have on heavy rotation. It's the same words, and those words are of great comfort because they're beautiful, beautiful words. They're good words. The way we do things, uh, you know, we become very attached to, obviously. Now, we are forced to fast from that familiarity and from that, those ideas about how things should be, because they're simply not available. So I'm finding myself challenged out of necessity, and so I'm trying to just show up to this challenge, um, to think about our relationship to these, these um, practices, these outward invisible signs. And what I'm wondering is, how much have we used even these precious things, these precious sacraments, these precious ways of gathering, these gifts of God? How much might we be using these gifts of God as placeholders for uh, deepening our own faith, as opiates to numb the pain of the rest of our lives, as... Um, Places to exercise, exercise our addictions to control and thinking that if we can just sort of exert our will, then we can get it our way and uh, not be threatened by the way other people want to practice these things. These are really uncomfortable questions, but these are really uncomfortable times. So um, I'm posing them, I'm not answering them. But I think they're important, and I think if we come through these times having not asked them, we'll be poorer for it. I suspect that when things are back to normal, um, first of all, that normal will be very temporary before we're back into another um, social distancing kind of um, situation like we are in now, um, to let this thing move through spreads, uh, through, through, spread through us in, in, in digestible, medically um, meetable waves of illness. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I, I hear that. Um, 
What that also probably means is that we will do our grieving in waves. Um, I've already begun talking with folks uh, who are losing people and, you know, life also goes on and lives come to their ends, even without a virus. And yet we're not able to gather. So um, on this day in which we remember the death of Christ, I thought it was also a moment to say, if you're anxious about that, you're not alone. But I do want to speak to that anxiety and say, um, in the most quiet and solemn conversations I think I've had with colleagues, we've thought very, very deeply and with broken hearts about that. And um, there are some plans and guidelines for those sorts of things. So I want you to not worry about those, um, those things. What probably it means is as these restrictions are lifted, we'll have whole waves of delayed grieving and we'll need to do that grieving together and we'll need to support one another. We don't know exactly what the world is going to look like after this in whatever that sort of, you know, after is that we're all kind of waiting for on pins and needles. Um, but we do know that anytime there's change, there's some loss. And um, in terms of a, a pandemic, that loss means loss of life too. But none of that is outside of God's reach. None of that is outside of human experience. Um, all of this is pretty much guaranteed as part of the deal of getting to be human for a few brief, beautiful, poignant breaths on this beautiful creation. So again, nothing is happening that is so uh, new or strange or hor horrible that it's outside of God's sight. It's outside of what's really normal in the longer scheme of things. And um, in the midst of it, these days of our, our most solemn, most reverent, most holy, most precious um, days of, of liturgy and worship, even as we're fasting from them, hold within them the wisdom that we so need. So this is what I mean when I say um, this Good Friday is more real than probably any Good Friday most of us have ever experienced. Everything that we've practiced, all the stories that we've read, all the stories that we've heard, all the prayers that we have lifted in the solemn colics, all of the, the, the kneeling and the silence, let those Good Fridays past be present in you now. They are no less real and they are no less true for not being played out with one another in the grand liturgical drama that we're offered by the church this year. In fact, they may even be more true. Because if we're actually showing up to this fast, if we are showing up to these prayers, which, you know, I'll link to them in the, in the video description, if we show up to these in our full presence, in our full fear, in our full sense of loss, in our full sense of love and gratitude of having been given one another, that will be the acceptable worship that God asks for, that God knows we need. So I expect this is going to be a hard day for a lot of people. It's already a hard day for me. Um, but I know that you are out there. And um, even last night in Maundy Thursday, I swear I could feel the stillness of so much prayer rising. Um, and that is a profound, oh, what, what a mind-blowing gift. Um, I will try to be present throughout this day and holding so many of you um, in my prayers as well. And I'm also helping a young friend of mine turn 12 today with an online birthday party. So we've got the full spectrum of human experience here. Um, 
again, as always, I miss you. Uh, you're in my prayers. You're in my thoughts so much of the time. Um, I hold you whenever I'm walking in the woods, whenever I'm on jogs and see the sky. And uh, these, these um, early morning runs that I've been going on are the best places to, to feel the immensity of all of my um, feelings and that seems so overwhelming. So um, <sighs> we're in it. I'm just going to give you this one more time. <sighs> 